Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We are studying through the book of Acts, uh, survey style, and we are now looking at chapters 23, uh, picking back up at chapter 23. Uh, not sure how far I'll go. I think we're going to make some headway here. So we've reached chapter 23. Paul has gone up to Jerusalem. Uh, some believe he went there willfully, uh, carnally, uh, not led by the Spirit. Others believe that he was there by the leading of the, of, of the Holy Spirit or the leading of the Lord. His own testimony is that God had warned, warned him to flee from Jerusalem to minister among the Gentiles. I'm certain he went up to Jerusalem because he wanted to go. Uh, it seems obvious that the Holy Spirit has also taken him there and God has encouraged him and comforted him. In addition to that, we know from other accounts that Paul was accompanying a great offering that had been taken among the Gentile churches for the needy believers in Jerusalem. Um, there may well have been a point of great interest in the heart of Paul and a concern for his own people in that when he got to the city of Jerusalem, he presents himself the next day to James and, and to the leaders in the fellowship. He gave an account of what God had done with him among the Gentiles, which resulted in uh, great praise. However, the leaders of the fellowship there at, at Jerusalem pointed out that there were thousands, literally thousands of Jews who believed in in Christ, but were zealous for the law. That's a that is a contradiction in theology, to be sure. And they asked that Paul, rather than give a testimony of opposition to the Jewish uh, customs and traditions, that he uh, instead that he would uh, uh, actually pay for the the cost of seven men going through a vow in the temple, and. Paul agreed to do that, and it was in the temple that he was arrested and accused of things that were not true. Kind of reminds me of something else going on today. But that's another video. In reading through the account, I was struck really by just how familiar the account is in many ways to what I see happening uh, to a, uh, another uh, popular messenger today. Uh, so anyway, he asks the uh, captain of the guard for an opportunity to present his cause before the mob in the temple. The guard was amazed that he spoke Greek, that he was a Roman citizen. Uh, he gave him the right, but the people wouldn't listen. And so they arrested him. They took him away, really in order to save his life. Of course, we know who did the saving here. The Jews were so infuri infuriated by that that they would have killed him on the spot. So he, he's now making a defense before the council in order to hold Paul as a Roman citizen. There's got to be a charge. And so we're trying to establish a charge. And, and uh, in Acts 23, Paul's before the council. This is at least the fifth time probably more, but at least the fifth time that this council has heard a testimony about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, I wouldn't be able, I, no one would be able to say that every member of this council is exactly the same council who had condemned Christ, but surely it's within every possibility. I mean, every reason that many of them were still there who had participated in the condemnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's entirely conceivable that some were there when Paul was on the Sanhedrin. I pointed out when we went through the 13th chapter that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. He casted a vote as a member of the Sanhedrin. So it well could be that some were still there who were there when he was on that council. In fact, it says as we begin our study in the, in the 23rd chapter that Paul earnestly looked at them so it appears that he was trying to convince them of his innocence, and it 
it may well have been that he's uh, looking for a friendly face, somebody who was actually there when he was there. Ananias made a charge against the law, who was the high priest, and Paul boldly uh, rebuked him for that. Uh, Paul was then told that uh, he was, uh, well, you know, he was the high priest and he submitted himself to the tradition of the fathers for the word of God. He showed him respect uh, or to give honor to where honor is due. Uh, then in verse 6, Paul stands before this council. He, he sees uh, right away that it's relatively even divided between the Sadducees uh, the ones who don't believe in the resurrection and, and the Pharisees who do believe in the resurrection. And so, you know, we see Paul declaring that he was a Pharisee and for the hope of the resurrection of the dead, he was here before the council. Uh, you know, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees in, in, the, in, in the sense that Pharisees were zealous for the word of God and believed in the resurrection of the dead. You know, Paul was certainly a Pharisee. You know, it'd be the same as you claiming to be a Christian and you or I claiming to be, you know, a Christian. Paul was a Pharisee. That is one who was zealous for the law, who believed in the resurrection. You know, now, you know, I mentioned, I think I pointed out that the Pharisees, they got their name uh, as separatists. The, the name basically means that. And uh, they, they carried it far to far extremes, as many Christians do today. That, of course, immediately caused great discussion on the council. So you know, anyway, some, some, some of them say, well, you know, this guy's not so bad. You know, he agrees with us. And some said, well, this guy is really terrible and you ought to be beaten to a pulp and, you know, put to death. The hostility was so great that the captain of the guard realized he wasn't going to get anywhere. So, you know, the, uh, you know, the captain of the guard, he took Paul out before they could, you know, you know, tear him from limb to limb. You need to understand that the Jewish council was a tremendously well-organized group. J Jewish jurisprudence is the backbone of our law today here in America. They were extremely zealous for order. They didn't like confusion. Uh, they were, you know, all, all about the nitpicking of the law. And yet in the cases of Christianity, they always violated their own procedures in the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the high priest who voted first. But in, in all of Jewish tradition, the high priest always voted last you got to realize that they had enough sense to realize, you know, that the younger members of the council, you know, would surely be influenced by the high priest, you know. You know, it's okay, y'all cast your votes, and, you know, and the kid on the council says, well, hey, how's the high priest going to vote? And, you know, you know, because I got to vote, I'm going to, I'm going to vote the same way he does. So the high priest always voted last. So he couldn't possibly influence anybody else's vote. How do you imagine it would be when the Lord Jesus Christ is being charged there and the high priest says, you know, we don't need any further evidence. The guy's guilty. You know, what, what could the rest of the council say? And then, of course, under Jewish law, the council was unanimous. And we have the account in the Gospels that in fact it was in the, in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the man was set free. We, we don't put up with a hung jury. In our, I'm in, I'm in America, as you know, we don't, we don't really, we're not big fans of hung juries. But the Jews had this reasoning that if everybody on the jury was against you, then you didn't have anybody defending you and you were, to put it in our language today, you, you were railroaded, basically. Kind of reminds me of something else going on today that I don't have time to get into. So they wouldn't do that. 
you know, if, if there's a unanimous vote on the council, you were immediately set free. Well, in, in the case of, of our Lord and Savior, it was, uh, it was a unanimous consent, but Christ was not set free. Of course, the, they, they were so violent that they absolutely violated their own tradition, their own procedure, and they would have done physical harm to Paul just like they did with the Lord. And someone else I won't mention. So the captain takes him out, puts him in the prison that night. Lord stands by Paul. Uh, that verse 11, be of good cheer. Uh, you've testified of me in Jerusalem. You're going to bear witness at Rome. Uh, there's no charge made here against Paul. It's not the, it, you know, Lord doesn't come to Paul. You know, he didn't come and, and, and say, well, Paul, if you'd have listened to me, you wouldn't be in this mess. You know, see, I told you, Paul, if you insisted on going your own way that this would happen. Folks, the Lord doesn't do any of those things. In fact, from the Lord's standpoint, you could never establish the fact that Paul's out of the will of the Lord. The other Christians said he shouldn't go. His own testimony is that the Lord commanded him to flee from Jerusalem and present the gospel to the Gentiles. But every time we have an indication from the Holy Spirit, it is comfort, encouragement, instruction. There's no condemnation. There's no sense of guilt or condemnation. And if you as a Christian feel convicted, it is not the Holy Spirit that convicts you. Contrary to popular opinion. I don't know how many times I've sat in church and heard somebody say, you know, I know the Spirit is convicting people here tonight. Folks, He doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit encourages you. He comforts you. He instructs you. But He never convicts you. Never. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You are not of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're children of God. You're the family, the household of God. You are comforted by the Holy Spirit. He's, he's the paraclete, the one that comes alongside. He's, he's our comforter. It's important for you that I go away because if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. You know, the very name of the Holy Spirit is comforter, not convictor. So the Lord stands by Paul. Be of good cheer. I'd think if you didn't know anything else, if it didn't say the Lord stood by him, if it just said be a good cheer, you'd have to, to say that, you know, that's probably the Lord because when he came in the room, the doors being shut with the disciples, he said, peace. It's not what I'd have said. You know, I'd be like, you, you, you idiots, you know, what are you doing here? I told you I was going to rise from the dead and you'd, you'd have had several hours of tongue lashing before I ever got around to saying peace. But the first thing the Lord said to disobedient, frightened, distraught disciples was peace. Now I'm certain that the word is magnifying Christ. Paul has been absolutely rejected by his own people, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, uh, as well, or not, if not as well as, or if not better educated than, than any other single member of that council. A man who had, had great influence and great wealth. A, a man who listened to the rulers of the church. His brother in Christ. He, he had come up submissively. He gave him an account of the ministry that God had laid on him to give you know, among the Gentiles. He had treated them as the elders in the city and they suggested that he go into the temple. There are you know, literally thousands of Jews who believe. Where are they? They didn't listen. When he stood on the stairway and said to the captain, could I speak for a moment? The captain was amazed he could speak Greek. And then he turned and he spoke to the crowd in Hebrew. 
a Jew, Pharisee of the Pharisees. They wouldn't listen. Where were those thousands of believers who were saying, hey, let the man speak? You know, where was anyone coming to his defense when he, when he appeared before the council and now he's in prison? Where are the thousands of believers in Jerusalem who are bringing him, you know, cakes with saws in it? Or something like, yeah, well, that's a joke I shouldn't have said, I guess. But, but, but where's the comfort he should have received from his brother in Christ? It's not there. And if you just if one looks at the white spaces, it it had to have been a low moment in the life of Paul. You know, he the guy had known lashings, whippings, shipwreck, torture, danger, every in every possible conceivable way, stonings. But but now now as as far as we know, this is the first time in his life when he must have, have felt totally rejected by his brethren in Christ and. And the Lord stands by him and says, Be of good cheer. You know, one, one could almost argue that such a comment doesn't make any sense. You know, Lord, if you want me to be a good cheer, I don't want to be in prison. I don't want to be suffering. I don't want to be an outcast. I don't want to be an accused criminal. I haven't done anything wrong uh, against your people or the law or... Folks, the Word of God has not pulled any punches. God has not indicated that He's called you and I to an ecstatic life of joy with no pain and no suffering, no hardships, no difficulties, no trials. Everything's just all hunky-dory all the time. And, and, and the, more, the better Christian you are, the more hunky dory it is. God has openly declared, folks, that with great tribulation and suffering, we would enter into the kingdom. And that's what we're doing. His comment to Paul on the road to Damascus was, Paul, you're going to see how, much, how great a things you must suffer for my name's sake. The, but the question always comes, does, 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 does God have the right to do, to do that? I mean, to make, you know... God, of course, has every right to do that with what He ch chooses to do with His own people. But more than that, unless you call God a liar, what God is doing in the life of Paul is for Paul's good as well as the glory of the Lord. Think about that in your own life with all the trials that you go through. We have the testimony of the Lord that He bore witness at Jerusalem. doesn't look like He did. He came to Jerusalem. He said a few things to the elders of the church. Hardly said anything before the council before they were divided. He did get one word out that he believed in the resurrection of the dead and now the council had descended on him. You know, from your standpoint, in mine, it wasn't much of a testimony. While he had been six days in that temple, you know, you got to wonder what he must have said to, to these, those seven fellows. He must have wondered what they talked about. Wondered what he said to other people. He might have met in the temple, but from our standpoint, it looks like a wasted evangelical mission to the city of Jerusalem. But God says He accomplished it. Think about that in your own life. You bore witness for me in Jerusalem. You're going to do it at Rome as well. That's what you're going to do. It's a witness for me. It'll glorify me. But it's for your good also. Paul, be of good cheer. I get from that, Steve, you have a, a few, you know, you got a, you got a few views, viewers, subscribe, subscribe well, you know, what? You have, a, you have a small following, but be of good cheer. Folks, we absolutely do not know what God is doing behind the scenes, but we can see it would be beautiful if every one of us, when we looked at all this, we looked and tried to think of this as, think, not just look at this as, as a, I understand it's an historical account, but God is working behind the scenes. We don't tend to, to look at it that way much, uh, often, very often. We just don't. You know, it's just people. You know, we're looking at a, 
we're watching a movie, you know, play out of, you know, it's all a bunch of people. God's not even in, in the, he's not in, in, he's not a character, you know, in that, in that movie, but he is. Well, anyway, there were certain Jews, they made this uh, goofy promise to themselves, you know, they're not going to eat nothing until they kill Paul. You know, now, you you don't have many days when you make that decision. If you don't eat something, you know, you might you might you might have a few months. But if you don't drink anything, it's hard for me to believe they they're not even going to drink a drop of water. I mean, if that be true, they've only got about three days at the most, as most of you know, and they're going to be in real trouble, like kind of like those people on Naked and Afraid. Now, Paul's in the hands of the Roman government. These Jews are not going to eat nothing, drink nothing. I don't, I don't know whether that, that drink means wine or something else, and they could still drink water, but without any liquids at all, they got to be in a hurry. So Paul's nephew, he finds out about it, and he comes and he, he tells him, uh, basically, uh, well, he didn't really know who to tell, so he told Paul. Paul's a Roman citizen. He has the rights of Romans. Roman citizenship. So he says to the kid to go tell the captain of the guard, which he did. The captain of the guard must have believed him because we read that there were uh, a couple of hundred soldiers made ready to take him to seizure. Now, I don't know where those guys are who weren't going to eat and drink anything, but I'll, I'll bet it was a long three or four days. And Paul was taken to Caesarea so that he might be taken out of this conspiracy that threatened his life and would have greatly embarrassed the Roman government. Now he's down at Caesarea and there Claudia writes to Felix the governor. And we, we got Paul down here and Felix has got a, uh, got a look at him and the centurion has to give reason for bringing Paul down. So he writes a letter and says, I don't really know what's wrong with this guy, but it looked like he was going to be brought or killed. Uh, he, he's a Roman citizen. I don't see anything to accuse him of. Uh, verse 29, uh, nothing worthy of death. And they were going to murder him, and that wouldn't be good. So he commanded that he be taken away and brought to you. So Paul now is standing before Felix, the governor, in, in chapter 24. Uh, at the same time, the governor's uh, not, not about just to hear Paul speak. So he sends back to Jerusalem told the council if they want to come, we'll have this court case here. So they came down with their attorney, whose name was uh, uh, Turtle, Turtleus. I, I guess I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Tertullus. And they came down and appeared before the governor. And verses 2 through 9 are the uh, attorney's presentation to the governor. Now, beginning at verse 5, he's a pestilence. He's a mover of sedition. That is, he's trying to incite, you know, uh, you know an insurrection, right? Okay, you know. Incite the Jews against Rome, Roman rule, which, of course, is not true. It was Paul who was being thrown into prison and beaten. He wasn't beating people and throwing them into prison. He not only sowed sedition among the Jews, but he does it throughout the entire world. He's a a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, which he wasn't. He wasn't. He happened to be in the temple with seven men who had had a uh, made a Nazarite vow that didn't make Paul their ringleader. He wasn't even there. He he set out to profane the temple, which is exactly opposite of what he did. Basically, he submitted himself to tradition, to the tradition of the fathers and the Jews. They arrested him and they would have charged him according to their own law, but this crazy captain of the guard, he comes in, he violently takes him away from us so that we couldn't judge him according to our law, and he commanded us to come down here and present evidence before you. Now Paul gets up, gives his defense. The governor says that he could speak, and Paul simply points out he's been a judge for many years, so he, you know, he knows the tradition of the Jews. He he knows also that in that tradition, he has the opportunity to answer him for himself. Now, all these charges are laid against him. Verse 11, 
uh, only 12 days since he went to Jerusalem. He'd only been there 12 years ago. Only been 12 days since I came to Jerusalem. How in the world could I do all these things in the 12 days that I was there? I didn't dispute with a single man in the temple. If I did, where is that guy? Why isn't he here as a witness? I didn't excite the people, not in the synagogue, nor in the city. If I did, where are the witnesses? I have an attorney saying these things, but just because he says them, where are the witnesses? Verse 13, they can't prove the things that they're accusing uh, me of because I, 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 they didn't bring a single witness. Now, way up here in verse 10, Paul has pointed out that he knows that Felix has been a judge of the Jews and he knows that it takes the mouth of two or three witnesses to establish the charge in Jewish tradition. And these are the Jews who are making the charge. They, they came all the way down from the city of Jerusalem. They brought a high-priced attorney and, and, and not one single witness. Verse 14, Paul says basically in four, verse 14, I will admit to you that what they call heresy, I don't call heresy. I worship the God of my fathers, believing the things that are written in the law of the prophets. That was very tactful on his part. These are the representatives of the council these were the self-appointed protectors of the law and the prophets. They wrote volumes, hundreds, four or four hundred volumes on what the law meant. But Paul is clearly saying in the 14th verse that they don't believe it, and I do, and I, and I have hope toward God. They admit that they also present the same hope. They have hope toward God. I have hope toward God. However, my, my hope includes that there's a resurrection from the dead of both, of both the just and the unjust. I, I believe I exercise myself in a way that it's honorable, that, I, that I don't have any personal guilt in this matter. I have My conscience is, is clear. It's void of offense both toward God first and then men. I'm not going to do anything that violates the very thing that I hold dear. I came, I've been away for years, been nine years since I was there the last time, 14 years before that. I've only been up here a couple of days in the last 23 years. For years I've been away and, and I came to bring an offering to my nation. You know, do alms. Not. Where's the proof of these charges? All I talked about was my belief in the resurrection from the dead, which many of the council agrees with. And I told the council, I cried, I said, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question by you. This, this day, Felix had a more perfect knowledge of the way, verse 22, and he, and he said, when the chief captain comes down, I'll make a decision. So they keep Paul, they let him have liberty, they don't forbid any visiting privileges and so, so on and so forth. And so people are allowed to, to come in and bring him things and minister to him. Now Felix, he comes with his wife. He, he's, he sent for Paul and, and Felix uh, trembled and said, Go thy way. When I, when I have time, I'll talk to you. Uh, I'll call you. We know from history that Felix was a guy that, that couldn't make a decision. What, what he wanted was money. Somebody give him money. He had set Paul free. He also wanted to please the Jews, and that made it difficult to set Paul free. And, his, and what the little we know about Felix, he was a man of great vacillation. So he talked to Paul often, but he didn't set him free. Two years, Paul's there. We know very little about that two years, but God sure used him as a great witness to the governor. Festus comes. Well, you know, Felix would like to have Festus look at this. You know, he sure needs a charge for Paul. So Festus is the new governor, and Paul appears before him. The high priest and the chief Jews, they tell Festus 
what Paul had done and why he ought to be delivered to him. You know, he wants him sent to Jerusalem, and on the way they're going to have assassins, uh, vagabonds kill him. But Festus said, no, let's keep him. He's going to protect Paul from any problems that might occur in Jerusalem. If there's anybody there in Jerusalem who's able to come down, present the charge, let him come. And so the Jews came down, stood round about. They said a lot of complaints against Paul. Uh, verse 7, they couldn't prove him. No witnesses, no way to prove him. Paul answered for himself, neither against the laws, the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offered or have I offended in anything at all. Festus, just like Felix, wanted to do the Jews a favor. So he said to Paul, you know, would you be willing to go back to Jerusalem to stand trial there? Now, if he can't stand trial, what chance does he have for trial in Jerusalem? It is wrong to accuse Paul of carnality for appealing to Caesar from a human standpoint, the only option that he had. But bear in mind, God's already told him that he's going to bear testimony in Jerusalem. You will bear testimony in Rome also. Been almost three years. Haven't gone to Rome yet. Boy, that's, that's a long time, three years. Paul appeals to Caesar. Seems to me, humanly, it was the only option that he had. Coupled to that option is the realization that God had told him he's, gonna, he's going to Rome. It's the obvious, obvious thing to do if you're a Roman citizen. He had that right. You know, if he wasn't, if he hadn't been a Roman citizen, he couldn't have made that appeal. I'd have no chance at all in any trial in Jerusalem. Therefore, I appeal to Caesar where I belong. I'm being charged against the Roman government. I ought to be tried by the Roman government. Well, Festus doesn't have any option then since Paul's appeal to Caesar. Paul has to be sent to Caesar. That put Festus in a really ridiculous, tremendously embarrassing sort of position. The Caesar we're talking about was Nero at the time. Nero was a, a Nero was an idiot. To, all right, and I'll just say it. You know, that to put it in the kindest terms. But even so, you couldn't just impose upon the graces of the court that easy. Caesar had a a lot of a pull, a lot of weight, a lot of say. He, obviously, you know, he's he's basically the Supreme Court. And then I don't suppose the Supreme Court is really interested about some trivial case that you might have against your neighbor. You know, I, I, I realize that our law gives you the right to appeal all the way to the Supreme Court, but what little bit I know about it, there's, there's some cases, misdemeanors, which don't have any right to go as high as the Supreme Court. Now, the first thing that Caesar's court's going to want to know when Paul gets to Rome is what's the charge against him? And without any charge, Festus is in a kind of a pickle. King Agrippa, well, he's a man who's living very carnally at the time. Festus thinks this is a great opportunity to talk, and he basically, basically says, if I could paraphrase, you know, I got a, I got a guy here that's been arrested by the Jews, come down to with uh, Roman escort, Roman guards, uh, Roman care, uh, and he's appealed to Caesar, and therefore to Caesar he's got to go. And now King Agrippa's there, and he's quite interested. And you have the great defense before King Agrippa in chapter 26. Marvelous chapter. It's just fraught with intense drama and adventure. Folks, it's true. It really happened. This really did happen in a Roman court 2,000 years ago. Paul presents a brilliant defense before Agrippa, recounting his experience on the road to Damascus, that he was zealous for the law, that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, that he persecuted people who believed like he did. In fact, he went to the very high priest and got permission to put them to death, and, and he participated in the execution of those who believed exactly as he believes. But on the road to Damascus, he had this amazing experience. There are, there are witnesses to that. Not some wild claim of emotionalism. Paul wasn't out of his head. 
but a, a party traveled with him, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, member of the council, zealous for his nation with witnesses who could bear testimony to his experience on the Damascus road, you know, points out what God had done to him. Uh, God told him who he was, rise, stand on your feet, and so forth, you know, uh, that you're going to be a witness, both of these things which you've seen and heard. Now, God has, has used Paul before the council, before Felix, before Festus, before those who ministered to him for three years, and now before King Agrippa, and eventually, I'm sure, before Nero. And Paul's commission was to be used of the Lord to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's like, I didn't disobey this vision. I didn't disobey this man. You know, when you get this voice from heaven that kind of knocked you down, you lose your eyesight. I, mean, I, I didn't disobey this heavenly vision. I was shown to those at Damascus and then in Jerusalem. I bore testimony of this to the Gentiles. All of that testimony has been one of repentance and righteousness. And it's for this cause that the Jews caught me in the temple who want to kill me for what is good for Rome and for the nation. However, God delivered me. I'm here this day, still here, three, three years later, still witnessing to both people, to people both small and great, saying nothing other than what I've always preached and what the prophets, in fact, and what Moses preached, which is what the council professes to defend. <laughs> Amazing. Now, verse 23, I believe, is a climatic verse in the Word of God. If you want to know what the Old Testament teaches, it teaches that Christ should suffer, that He should be the first that should rise from the dead, and that He should show light unto the nations, unto the people. That's the Jews and also the Gentiles. If you want any concise statement of what you read in the Old Testament, what the Old Testament is teaching you from Genesis to Malachi is that Christ should suffer, that He should be the first one to rise from the dead, and that He is the one who gives light to everyone who belongs to Him. I just did a summary, a survey of the Old Testament in about, like, what, a couple of sentences, I think. I, I don't take that verse lightly. Paul's testimony before Felix has been a testimony that it at least bore evidence of his education and his training. Folks, that guy's education, Paul's education, would put to shame those who were sitting in judgment over him, and they knew it. They knew it. King Agrippa knew that a man named Jesus had performed miracles, that he knew that he was crucified. He knew that there was a, a testimony throughout the Roman world that this man had risen from the dead. Agrippa knew that. Agrippa knew that. Just think about this far close. Think about it. This is kind of off on the side, a sort of footnote as a footnote. But just think about it. You know, think about this. Think about a movement that drew a multitude of converts uh, that bucked the system so that its leader was unjustly persecuted by those who were in power, uh, who were given the truth, who knew the truth, who could find no guilt in him, just lies and trumped up charges. You'd think that you were talking about MAGA, right? Well, it depends on your political persuasion, I, I know, but uh, no, it's, how about the Apostle Paul, mega, make everyone great, make everybody great again. You know, I don't know, I guess it just sounded good. Look, I love you all, I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.